Hi, my name is Steve Curl, and I've, I'm chair of the Oversight Board for Zero Carbon Cumbria. And it's a great pleasure to be talking with you guys this morning. Um, thanks for your time. And we're very grateful for the support of the Chamber. Just by way of a few words of introduction, and then I'll let my colleagues do the hard work. Um, the partnership is a group of about 80 organisations um, from all walks of life. They tend to be collective organisations because, as you'll hear, we're going to build uh, a very extensive network throughout Cumbria's businesses and communities in order to encourage decarbonisation of the county. So we've got people like both of the councils, the National Parks, um, University of Cumbria, Lancaster, a range of business organisations, the Chamber, the LEP, um, the Cumbria Tourism, for example. So a, a wide group, along with uh, people like Electricity Northwest, United Utilities, and so on, all large organisations through whom we can communicate with a large number of their associates, partners, um, businesses, and so on. So uh, it's an encouraging state of progress so far. And you'll hear a lot this morning about what we're doing. And this is all targeted on getting a plan which leads to action next year um, to promote achieving zero carbon in Cumbria in a timely way to keep our part of the bargain to remain within one and a half degrees of warming since the pre-industrial times. It doesn't sound like much, but it makes a heck of a business, a heck of a difference, as you will all appreciate. So without further ado, I'd like to pass on to Tim to explain what we're doing. And then John's going to talk about the carbon footprint of the county. Thank you. Thanks very much, Steve. Can everyone hear me okay, first of all? Yeah. Great, that's, that's a good start. Um, thank you. Thanks very much for the opportunity to, um, to join you on the call today and, and to introduce you to the work of the Zero Carbon Cumbria Partnership. Um, my name is Tim Gale. I'm the Zero Carbon Cumbria Partnership Manager. Um, and I'm just going to run through a few slides before I hand over to John, just to introduce you to the work of the partnership and the, um, the, the what we're doing towards the pathway to net to net zero um, across that partnership. And then I'll hand over to John, and John will take you through a bit more detail on uh, the baseline emissions and uh, a bit more on those priority uh, areas that we've identified to tackle those emissions. So as Steve said, we're a, a multi-agency partnership of about 80 organizations and collectively together, um, it's, an, it's an amazing partnership um, to be involved with. The wealth of knowledge and experience across all of those um, different partners it is, is huge. And I think there's a real um, collective um, want to, to achieve our target of net zero by 2037. Um, we want to do that in a way that um, maximizes the, the wider benefits of decarbonization for the county. So really improving the quality of life for our, our communities and um, helping businesses with the transition to net zero, of course, um, and really working out how we um, maximize those opportunities from that transition to a low carbon economy. Have the next slide, please, John. Thank you. Um, so this graphic is, as it says, um, a, a, an illustration of how we see the, the pathway to net zero and the process by which we're planning that um, over the next few months and, and uh, years ahead. The partnership is um, working very hard and, and has established um, a very clear baseline uh, of emissions for the county. And we've done that through working with Small World Consulting and our experts uh, in that area. So that's really helping us to establish where the emissions come from. As I say, John will pick up more detail on that later. But that has been our, our sort of benchmarking um, exercise so that we know how much carbon we need to then save and, and where that's really important that we establish where that carbon is uh, and tackle that um, sector by sector. So we've, we've looked at the trajectories for that, understanding how much carbon will need to be saved for different sectors and developed some priority emission um, actions as, as a result of that work. So that's now feeding into uh, the work of four sector groups that we've established across transport, waste, farming, and buildings. And um, we're looking at um, uh, delivering and, and publishing uh, emission reduction action plans. If you hear um, the acronym ERAP, that's what that stands for. So those emission reduction action plans um, across those four um, four sector groups 
will provide a, a pathway of, of actions to get us towards um, that net zero 2037 target. We then hope that we'll take that work, we'll understand particularly um, where, where there are gaps and challenges and barriers to, to the ambitions of those sector group plans, and we'll hold a, um, a zero carbon summit in March of next year, where we hope to um, start to look at how we, we might tackle those gaps and, and bring in other key partners to help us deliver the work of those four groups, moving towards a, a wider decarbonisation plan for the county that would be all encompassing and, and bring in um, other areas and, of emissions, as I say, that we've identified as, as gaps through those four groups, uh, uh, emission reduction action plan work. And then of course, moving on from that, we'll, we'll need to monitor that. We'll have some key indicators across all of those actions in that plan so that we can track and monitor our progress. We're also developing a wider monitoring framework of all of the actions that we're, we're proposing through this work. And I think importantly, what, what we want to do from that is, is provide a, a legacy framework, if you like, that is, uh, will enable future projects and, and programs both within the county and outside to, um, to kind of get a step ahead, I suppose. So some shared learning from the work that we will have um, done through this process. So we can go on to the next slide. Thanks, John. So I mentioned ERAPs, em Emission Reduction Action Plans. I won't go through all of these points here, but just to highlight a few that those plans are really important across those four sector groups. We relaunched the groups um, in April of this year to really focus on producing those plans by the end of the year. Um, and importantly, those, those plans are establishing what's already happening in the county and quantifying what that means in terms of carbon reduction. Um, we're looking also at, at further actions and changes that will be needed. So that kind of gap analysis on those trajectories to net zero, um, where is it that the uh, programs that exist already will need to be worked up at scale and pace? Um, and where will we need also new actions to, to get us on that timeline? Um, very importantly as well, identifying the key stakeholders that will be involved in um, putting both putting the plans together now and establishing those actions, but also looking ahead at the partners that we will um, we will need to, to work with very closely to do the delivery part of that, that work and the implementation. And of course, alongside that um, is, is a, a timeline, you know, establishing that, those different emission uh, pathways. Some actions will um, hopefully be able to happen fairly quickly. Others will be medium others, uh, term, others will be, will be longer term. So very much looking at the timeline for the delivery of, of all of those actions. And then establishing those wider benefits as well. Really important that we're able to communicate with uh, businesses, communities, organisations that decarbonisation will have uh, wider multiple benefits. Um, and it's really important that we identify those as well as actually the, the reduction of the carbon itself. And um, through that process as well, as I say, looking at gaps, irreducible emissions, understanding that and the dependencies and risks where we think we might not have so much influence over certain emissions, establishing how we might change that and, and increase that influence, and then really being very clear on where we think we can't tackle emissions and why. That could be for all sorts of reasons to do with um, you know, national policy framework that we're working within or, or, or funding or uh, gaps in expertise or, or whatever it might be. So really, really critical that those plans help us understand um, where we think we can most easily take action, but where there might also be gaps. And then also, as I've already mentioned, that tracking and progress and reporting um, will be really important so we understand where we're, where we're making an impact. Thanks, John. We'll go on to the next one. I've mentioned the, the wider benefits. I think certainly, you know, I really believe that this is, this is really important. I think it helps us gauge um, different organizations um, Different, different groups, I'd say multi, quite a complex multi-stakeholder partnership. Um, there's lots of people there, part of the partnership for different reasons. They have different drivers, different remits um, driving their work. And so I think highlighting and making sure that we help our partners understand that decarbonisation will help drive multiple benefits for our community's environment. Um, you know, obvious things like warmer homes, better air quality and lower household bills, as well as help, helping 
uh, nature to recover um, a really important um, uh, benefit for all of our, our partners and, and communities. But there are also um, really clear benefits, we believe, for, for our businesses uh, in, in, in Cumbria. So to highlight a few of these, I won't go through all of these um, in turn, but there are some obvious, very practical um, benefits from, from decarbonisation around saving energy and, and um, saving uh, money from uh, buildings. We know utility bills are incredibly high, so those cost savings and as, as well as other uh, resources will be, be really important. I think it also helps us with um, understanding how there's a changing demand from customers and probably companies up and down supply chains um, requiring us to demonstrate our climate credentials. So I think that, that also helps to do that and, and um, helps us um, be more credible as a sort of responsible um, business when it comes to, to climate change as well. And then not least, new jobs, that transition to a low carbon economy um, comes with real opportunities. We're working very closely with further education, higher education um, establishments to look at, you know, what are the future needs of the county when it comes to um, the low carbon economy and, and realising all of those opportunities. And then, of course, a, a, another pra very practical um, wider benefit is that we potentially can really have a, a big effect on reducing climate risks. And that, I think, is both to our, our assets, our buildings, um, our homes, um, but also the potential impact to, um, to our supply chains, uh, communications, all of those things that come with more frequent and extreme weather events. So lots and lots of co-benefits for us to, to realise through this process, as I say, for businesses uh, and our communities in the county. So I hope that's a useful brief introduction to uh, the kind of work that the partnership um, is involved with. I'm now going to hand over to John Forbes, who is our Zero Carbon Cumbria project manager. And John is going to take us through a bit more information about the baseline data and some of those main priority areas that we've identified for action. So over to you, John. Thanks. Thank you, Tim. Thank you, Tim. So as Tim mentioned, a starting point for the work of the sector groups has been to work with uh, Small World Consulting, who are specialists in carbon accounting, and have uh, analyzed the various emissions associated with Cumbria, and then identify some priority areas for action. And in terms of identifying those priority areas, we're really looking at those where Cumbria has a reasonable level of either control or influence so that we can take action to both reduce emissions and realize some of the wider benefits that Tim mentioned. And as I'll explain shortly, uh, these priority areas map uh, pretty well across to the scope of the various emission sector groups that we've established, although there is one gap in relation to industrial processes. It'll be interesting to discuss that with you in a few moments. So starting looking at the various emissions associated uh, with Cumbria, uh, we've looked at these in various different categories, as you can see on the graph on this slide. But our first point to make is that um, our analysis is based around what's known as a consumption-based approach. So as well as looking at the emissions which are produced in Cumbria, we also look at the upstream emissions associated with the supply chains. And when you look at this in terms of uh, industry and other businesses, you can see here, these are the emissions, production emissions associated with the use of electricity and other fuels uh, in Cumbria. And then also here, this large bar is the emissions associated with the supply chains for the uh, industry and other businesses in Cumbria. Um, I'll look at these in a bit more detail in a moment. When we look at residents, uh, that breaks down into sort of four basic areas. Around 20% is home and accommodation. About 30% is to do with travel. 25% uh, is actually to do with food and drink that are um, consumed by residents. And most of these emissions are in the product associated with the production, manufacture, retail, and distribution of the food. So the food and drink industry clearly play a key role in this respect. And then the other 25% relates to the other goods and services associated with residents. When we look at visitors, uh, most of these emissions associated with travel, both the travel in and around Cumbria and also to and from Cumbria. So that's clearly really important for the uh, tourism sector in Cumbria. 
when we look at land use, this is an interesting area because uh, this is one where we have both sources of emissions, such as um, emissions from livestock and the use of fertilizer, uh, but we also have sinks in terms of the carbon dioxide absorbed by trees and uh, forestry and other carbon sinks. And finally, the, on this graph, we also look at the emissions associated with uh, the traffic on the roads in Cumbria. And this includes both the emissions from the exhaust pipes, but also the upstream emissions associated with uh, producing the fuel. And as I expect you'll also you'll be, you'll already realize, in some cases, emissions may occur in more than one category. As a couple of examples, for example, within resident travel, uh, if they tra that travel within Cumbria would also uh, be an emission captured within the roads um, here. And also if a president buys food which has been uh, produced in Cumbria, uh, then it might be that there are emissions associated uh, with that food which appear in both the residence one and the land use and possibly also industry one as well. So one of the things we try and avoid in this case is sort of adding these together. But it does mean that we want to look at when we look at the priority areas, we have tried to avoid any of this um, um, double counting. If you'd like to have find out more detail about the breakdown of this, we've uh, put a, a summary of the analysis on the website. There's a report you can download. But I thought just in terms of uh, today's session, we'd look a little bit more detail at the emissions associated with industry and other businesses. And this graph shows the breakdown into some of the key um, sectors of the economy. And a couple of points to note here, it won't be a surprise to you that most of the emissions are associated with manufacturing extraction. But in this analysis, we also include um, the public sector. So essentially, it, it's all the non-domestic emissions. Uh, so it covers um, all the private sector businesses, um, public sector, um, and then things like arts, entertainment, and recreation, and so forth. Also mentioned, this is based on the consumption basis. So around about a third of these are the production emissions in uh, Cumbria and two thirds of them are associated with the supply chains. And that's a, it, it varies a little bit sector by sector. So within the manufacturing and extraction, it's about a third production, two thirds supply chain. In the construction sector, it's nearly, I think it's nearly 90% of the um, emissions associated with the supply chain. So that's all the energy used to produce the construction materials. In something like transport and storage, I think the majority of those emissions are production based. As I said, when we've done this analysis, our real interest is in what are these priority areas where we have reasonable level of either control or influence. So this next graph shows some of these priority areas that we've identified. So on the left-hand side here, we see two associated with the energy use in buildings. The left-hand column is the uh, use in domestic buildings, in housing across Cumbria. And then there's also energy used in the non-domestic buildings. So this is an estimate of the energy used in a whole range of buildings from businesses, public sector buildings, and so forth. Interestingly, when you look at that analysis, you can see over the last 10 to 15 years, there's been significant reduction in emissions associated with the electricity used in buildings. And that's primarily due to the decarbonization of the grid. So it's, it's increasingly, it's important to us to try and address the energy used for the gas and the other fuels for uh, heating and hot water. When we look at travel, obviously we've got the resident, we've got the visitor travel. Um, and most of that visitor travel is actually to and from Cumbria. And then we have a, a, a priority area relating to the emissions associated with industry and business travel. And then one to do with car manufacture. This really highlights if you like, the embedded energy uh, in the production of the cars that are used by the residents and the visitors. Those are the priority areas associated with travel. As I mentioned a few minutes ago, in terms of food and drink, most of the emissions associated with the food and drink consumed by residents and visitors in Cumbria is actually in the supply chains so the production and the manufacture of retail and distribution of food. So this is an important area for us to work with the food and drink industry. And other goods and products in this case would include things like clothing or electrical products and so forth which are bought by uh, consumers, uh, householders and, and visitors in Cumbria. Then we have three categories associated with land use. This first one here, you can see very small. That's partly because in this group, there are both sources of emissions such as degrading peat, but also sinks in terms of the forestry. And at the moment in Cumbria, there's a nearly imbalance. 
We also have the emissions associated with agricultural soils and livestock, the use of fertilizers and, and methane from uh, livestock. And at the moment, these are based around a methodology GWP 100, which stands for uh, global warming potential based around a hundred year life, uh, life, lifespan. We, are, we appreciate that the NFU and other organizations are, pro, uh, are proposing or, or pro promoting an alternative metric called GWP star. And so we, our, our sector group are in discussions with the NFU and others are looking about how we can see if we can show the analysis in both ways. And finally, there's a group on the, uh, sorry, ag agricultural energy use that relates to the buildings and vehicles used by on, on farms. And then finally, we have this group in terms of industrial processes, which is mainly the use of electricity and other fuels for um, um, industrial machinery and manufacturing plant equipment and so forth. Essentially, it's the production emissions in businesses, which is not captured in terms of either the energy use in buildings or um, industry business travel. And as you can see, these mostly map into the various sector groups we've established. And so I thought it'd be helpful just to look briefly at the scope of some of those sector groups and particularly those areas covered, uh, which are most interesting for businesses. So for each sector group, we put together a sort of schematic showing what is uh, covered by the sector group. This is one example relating to buildings. So you can see here, it looks at different types of buildings for everything from housing to um, offices, um, school buildings, and so forth. The one kind of building we haven't really asked the group, sector group to look at are these, um, or two is farm buildings, because that's covered by the land use group, uh, and also the large industrial buildings, which are very specific to particular purposes. And in most cases, they've got energy managers and the companies are already taking action to minimize the energy consumed and the emissions associated with those buildings. We also look at, obviously at the occupancy and the operation of the buildings, the energy used, the heating, lighting, uh, et cetera, for the buildings. But we also ask this group to look at emissions associated with the construction and the deconstruction of buildings. And I think someone was potentially on the call from the construction sector. So uh, it's interesting to, to, to we, uh, the scope of this group covers not just occupancy and operation, but these other elements as well. And as in all cases, there are cross links between the various sector groups. In this case, clearly there are some wastes generated from both construction and deconstruction. So we in, in the consumption waste and circular economy group looking and see what's the best, what can we do to minimize that waste, but also other opportunities to develop a, a circular economy uh, within Cumbria. Uh, so the next slide I think looks really at, from a business perspective at some of the areas covered by the sector groups. So. Um, in terms of buildings, as I mentioned, really it focuses on the energy consumption and cost. And as Tim mentioned, I think for a lot of businesses, they would have seen significant rises in energy costs recently. Uh, and the sector group is really looking at the options for um, uh, reducing the energy demand through improving building fabric and also low carbon heating and cooling. Um, it's, I think it's fair to say at the moment, the focus of that sector group has been on housing. Um, there are some areas which, where it's obvious synergies with um, uh, um, non-domestic building. Uh, one of the example here is the, the need to develop the supply chain in Cumbria. Um, obviously that supply chain could um, both help to retrofit domestic properties, but also non-domestic properties. And also there are some particular challenges around things like um, uh, uh, properties where there are tenants and landlords. And, I'm aware that for a lot of small uh, uh, medium-sized businesses, they are often a tenant on short-term leases in properties, which are, um, and therefore, therefore it makes it a, a challenge, if you like, for them to take some actions because it involves uh, making sure that their landlord gives consent and it may sometimes makes it more difficult to finance or justify the finance of those sorts of upgrades. So those are some of the sorts of topics which that sector group will be looking at and some of the the barriers if, uh, that Tim mentioned that we want to see if we can cover in the emission reduction action plans. The transport and mobility, uh, again, I think at the moment the focus is mainly on the individual transport. We do have um, some not, uh, business representation on that group, including Cumbria Tourism. Uh, it would be good to discuss how we could make sure that all aspects of um, business transport are covered in the emission reduction action plan for that group. Uh, for the consumption waste and circular economy group, I mentioned there that food manufacture and distribution is an important area. 
and this is maybe opportunities for us to link into some of the UK wide initiatives run by RAP, the Waste Resources and Action Programme. Uh, and it's good news to hear that I think Cumbria Tourism is working with RAP uh, and some of the hospitality businesses on their Guardians for Grub uh, initiative, which is helping to reduce food waste in hospitality businesses but uh, it would be interesting to discuss with you about opportunities to, to link all the food and drink manufacturing businesses in Cumbria into those sorts of initiatives. Uh, I've included here this reference to producer responsibility initiatives. These are the ones which are associated with things like packaging or electrical and electronic equipment and to see whether or not there are opportunities for us to help establish a sort of circular economy, more reuse and repair um, and waste minimization. And also the sector group within their scope is the waste arising from businesses in Cumbria. And again, I would think at the moment it's fair to say that the sector group is focused probably mainly on the household waste. So it might be something we'll pick up in the discussion, how we can make sure that we link in to what we, with the work that's been done already to help businesses reduce waste is covered, but also if there are other gaps there that we need to try and work with you to address. And the farming and other land use group has got good representation from both the farming businesses and other land management businesses. And they're looking at a whole range of uh, issues from a business perspective, and particularly in terms of reducing on-farm emissions. And that's finally for me then, uh, just a, a recap on some of the emissions that we've not yet covered by the sector groups. One is those of these large industrial buildings, which we think are, are because they're very specific and need specialist device, and also the industrial emissions um, which I think could you know, could include everything from sort of air compressors and um, uh, woodworking machinery and things like that in smaller um, um, industrial or manufacturing businesses through to the um, large scale manufacturing um, facilities across Cumbria. But at this point, I'm going to hand back to Steve, who's just going to introduce some of the points which would be helpful to discuss with you. Thanks very much, John. Um, so. You might well be sitting there and thinking, why is Zero Carbon Cumbria doing this? Um, the answer is because nobody else is doing it. And if Cumbria doesn't act in a coordinated way, um, then there's absolutely zero chance of achieving net zero. Um, so what we're trying to do is, is build a very extensive network to help us finalise the planning side of this and then to motivate people to engage and to take action whether it be an individual, a community, a business, a council, or whoever, um, with their partners to actually take the action to deliver zero carbon and to decarbonize their own activities. So it's a huge challenge. It's probably the biggest networking uh, challenge that Cumbria has ever taken. Um, if you think about it in the terms of comparison with perhaps the, the flood issues we've had in the county, um, or foot and mouth um, disease or that sort of thing. It's it's a massive enterprise that involves all sectors of the community um, from individuals through to large businesses. So one heck of a challenge and it won't work unless everybody puts their shoulder to the wheel as it were and joins the, um, the, the project. And, and that's what we're aiming to do. But as you've heard from both Tim and John, we've already covered, um, in addition to our partnership members, we're working with about 60 other people who are experts in the four priority areas we've described. So there's a heck of a resource being put into this on a voluntary basis to develop these plans with real expert input. And I think you can see from the graphics that John's shown you, that the four priority areas, all of them cover a significant part of any business's carbon emissions. And then that end area on the bar chart, if you can remember it, the industrial process one, that's an area where there's really intense use of energy in the driving of machinery or the running of process activities. Um, food and drink industry will be a good example in Cumbria that is being addressed by the local enterprise partnership in, in partnership with ourselves um, and is really focused on the top 15 or so very large emitters um, and you can understand that they'd be people like Iggerson for example um, who have a very significant uh, carbon decarbonization 
project. So what we're keen to try and achieve today is to start the process of working with the Chamber to address the SME community in parallel with the LEPS activities with the larger businesses and also their activities and grant funding for SMEs. So, so what we'd like to tr try and establish is a collaboration with the Chamber and its members to review the output from the four priority areas we're working on, to engage with us on the manufacturing and process energy consumption within larger facilities operated by SMEs in the county, and to try and ensure that we've not missed anything, uh, and to help us to decide on the actions that could be taken in SMEs in particular, but also more widely in business, commerce and industry to decarbonize. Um, and of course, as we move forward beyond the spring of next year after the summit meeting, which will be an invite only event for those that can coordinate and network and help us to drive um, an understanding of decarbonization requirements and, and to encourage and motivate people to take action. As we move beyond that, um, we're going to need to share a lot of best practice, give examples of how businesses have achieved decarbonization and the collateral benefits that's brought to them uh, in terms of cost reduction, increased profitability or productivity. So we're very, very keen to hear your views on how you might engage with us uh, and also whether you can identify other barriers that we've not identified which are holding back businesses. And I can well imagine that funding and finance might be a key one of those.